Access Pass. Uh, whether you're here as the live studio audience or whether you're walking, uh, watching back in your room, my name is Jason. I'm your cruise host, and this is the first of the whole series of them here on board the Rock and Romance Cruise. And I am sitting next to an absolute legend, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Mr. John Lodge. <laughs> Thank you very much. One, two. There you are, you're hot, yeah. Woo. I forgot how to use the microphone. <laughs> Too much time on the bass, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. We're very Thank you very much. Thank we're you. so excited to have you. Uh, just a softball question to start off. What were you doing over the past year, the last time we saw each other on this stage? Um, since last, I can't believe it was a year ago. No, it's crazy. It's flew by. Um, we've been... Actually, most of the year has been spent rehearsing uh, for the Days of Future past concert that I've been doing, and uh, whoever has uh, managed to see the concert uh, during the last uh, month, thank you very much. Uh, some familiar faces here. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much. Really, really means a lot. Um, you know. Dare I say, after all these years, thank you so much. Thank you. You have so many accolades. You have a laundry list of accolades. Uh, most recent, I say most recently, one of the more recent being the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Congratulations, well deserved. 50, I mean, Moody Blues is on about 50 years, and I mean, over 70 million albums. You are regarded as one of, the, one of the 10 most influential bass players of all time in the world. You have such a laundry list of accolades. How do you stay humble? Because you are. You're very humble. You're very, very humble. Uh, actually, look, at, when you look around at everyone, they're the people that keep me where I am. And thank you for that. Because not all are so humble. <laughs> as I'm sure you know very well. Uh, and, and as you're... Let me restructure this. Some years ago, when you're just picking up the bass for the first time, at what point did you realize you were onto something and you were going to be something? as opposed to just a guy plucking strings? I, I think it was happened a lot long before that time. Uh, when I was uh, 12, 13, uh, I saw uh, Rock Around the Clock. Oh, yeah. And up until then, I was, music really didn't capture me at all. And I saw this rock and roll film and I thought, there's something special here. I'd really like to be part of it. And um, a neighbor of mine in England, um, it, her son came back. In England at the time, when you were a teenager, you had national service, and he spent his time in Germany. And while he was in Germany, he bought a Spanish guitar with steel strings. Oh. And he brought it back to England. His mother said to my mother, would your Johnny like this guitar for five dollars? <laughs> and uh, I think, yep, I, my mum bought the guitar for me. And then I spent every day trying to fathom out how this guitar worked. And um, as I was learning and learning, I m managed to see Buddy Holly live in Birmingham. And uh, Birmingham. there was a singer-songwriter on stage with a tuxedo and, and a bow tie playing this rock and roll. And I thought, yes, that's the way to do it. Write your own songs, be yourself, and see what happens. And, um, but at the same time, um, I was listening to all the rock and roll records of the time and I was fascinated by the left hand side of the um, piano, all the boogie parts, people like Fats Domino, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, and I suddenly realized that captivated me and 
on my six string guitar, I started to learn all those riffs that the pianists, I could never play the piano, but I thought if I could capture those riffs, and I did that, learned all those, and then, um, then one day I was in Birmingham at my favorite music shop, and then in the window it said, direct from the USA, Fender Precision Sunburst Bass. I was 15 years of age, and uh, I rushed home to my dad <laughs> and said, Dad, you've got to help me. And uh, he came back into Birmingham and he signed the papers. Actually, I've still got the original paperwork. And um, I bought this guy, it's all the bass, there and then. And it is recorded nearly every Moody Blues song I've ever that recorded. That specific bass. And, uh, that's, really, that's amazing. And on, on, on my, what I was doing during the COVID, I wrote a couple of songs in these crazy times and the sun will shine. And I use the same bass for that. And it's uh, my hero, wow. Bad Bass. That's amazing. <laughs> You, you mentioned doing a little writing and producing during the COVID times. If I do understand correctly, you also learned GarageBand and you recruited some unlikely uh, cohorts on, on the... Tell us a little bit about what you did during COVID. Yeah, well, I, I've, uh, anyone, you may have been there in Boston, um, May, uh, March the 8th, March the uh, 1920. Yeah, yeah. And I flew down to Naples to see my grandson. It's his birthday. And on the 12th, we got locked down. I never saw him till July, where we unlocked. And uh, while I was there, I thought, what are we going to do? Uh, I, my bass and a guitar. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll have to build a little studio. So uh, I'd got an Apple computer and some keyboards and, and I learned garage band. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started writing and I wrote this song called In These Crazy Times. And uh, I r recorded everything and I think it needs some backing harmonies. And um, I said to my wife, who is here today somewhere. I said, Lucy, I need a backing singer. I know you've never sung before. <laughs> but in the wardrobe, there's a microphone. I said the ward in the microphone, in the wardrobe, because of, that was a great sound barrier. So I locked my wife in the wardrobe. I taught her the song. And I could believe it. It was all in tune and fantastic. So, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, I did more recruiting. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it was free. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, what I need now is a guitarist. And my son plays guitar, but he doesn't want to play professionally. He likes playing. So I sent him the files and said, come on, play guitar on this. And he played guitar in it, and it blew me away. And uh, so much so, I mixed the album. John Davis, Davison from Yes, joined me as well on backing vocals, and uh, I released the single in England. I love that story. I just think that's a great story. Even when you're one of the biggest rock and roll stars on the planet, you still recruit from your own family to get things done. It's, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Uh, now, as everybody knows that has been here before, and if you're watching on TV, you're always welcome to come and join us for All Access Pass, because one of the things we do is we know you want to know these stars as well. So you have an opportunity to fill out questions uh, that I get to ask these stars. So I don't want to monopolize all the questions. I want to ask some from the audience as we go. Uh, Anna Taylor, who comes to us from Croydon, PA, what is, oh, since we just talked about her, what is the secret formula to your long and happy marriage? <laughs> Lock her in the closet to play songs. <laughs> <That's what you're... laughs> yeah. uh, 
I, it, you've got to be equal in everything. And you really have. Everybody has to have their own life, life, and my wife does. And we share everything together. So that's the answer. Share, share, share. And I, I heard it. I heard it squawked out over here. How long have you been married, sir? Jesus. I'm sorry. sorry. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, ish. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm scared to say because my wife say. She got married when she was three years of age. <laughs> Fifty-four years. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Anna, Anna has a follow-up. She wants to know, as a, as a British gent, do you eat bubble and squeak? Bubble and squeak. You know, Emily, my daughter, she is here somewhere. I think everybody knows Emily. <laughs> she came back to my cabin today and said, Daddy, look what I found for you. Apple crumbled and custard. So that was as near as bubble and squeak. I, but you, I do eat bubble and squeak, yeah. As you should, as you should, of course. Uh, Michelle, who comes to us all the way from Minneapolis, this is an interesting one. If you could visit with anyone, living or dead, and you only had 30 minutes, who would you choose and why? I think I mentioned earlier, Body Holly, I think. Um, because I listened to all his records when I was like 13, 14, trying to fathom out how you made the recordings. And um, if you listen to them very carefully, they're are very clever recordings and with very few instruments and uh, I'd like to know how he did that and um, yeah trying to perfect what I'm trying to do now he would tell me the right way I'm sure give you the guiding yeah because you clearly haven't figured it out at this point <laughs> A failure. Oh, I don't know how you got on this show. Man. <laughs> Elizabeth, who comes to us from Pennsylvania. Uh, oh, this is a tough one. What is your favorite song that you have written? Um, I think it's a nice train. And she also wants to know, what is your very favorite venue that you've ever played? Do you have a favorite menu? Um, everybody is from different venues. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's no home run ball in this crowd, yeah. So, in no particular order, <laughs> um, going back through the 70s, there's a lot of the uh, open air venues across the USA I'd loved, but, um, we, I think we opened a place called Red Rocks. Yeah. And uh, other than, um, the other place I really enjoyed was um, the Gorge in Portland. Uh, in and I remember the first time we went there, lasers had just arrived on the scene for lighting. And they, is it the Columbus River? Yeah. Columbia. Yeah, Columbia. Yeah. Columbia. They had the lasers going off across the gorge. And it was an incredible sight. Incredible sight. That's, I'm from Portland. It's just down the way. And yeah, it's a, that's a great venue. Uh, Andy, also from, we have a lot of Pennsylvania uh, in the house. My goodness. Andy, the, the band's harmonics are incredible. When you wrote your songs, did you intend to create poetry and sound that actually pulls out this type of emotion, or were you just trying to write rock and roll? Um, when I was sort of eight, nine years of age um, at school, on the afternoon we used to have what was called a quiet period, where we had to go in the, to the school hall sit down and listen to a piece of classical music. And I think the idea was to give the teachers a break from us. 
But I think the harmonics from the classical music sort of went in the head and stayed in there. And uh, when I started writing songs, and when we as the Moody started writing songs and recording, we always used to think of the harmonics. How could we make this like a picture? And uh, and we used to record it exactly like that uh, t t t to cover every harmonic in the spectrum of music. Perfect. Of course, you can't get off a stage without this question. Uh, Miss uh, Carrie Kaufman, I believe, from Palm Bay, Florida. Somebody not, well, probably originally from Pennsylvania. Um, I would love to know the inspiration and meaning of Knights in White Satin. Well, Justin wrote the song, and uh, we were sharing, uh, uh, not sharing, we had a, in London, op actually, opposite the Russian embassy, was this old Victorian house, and the was dividing into uh, about six flats, uh, condos, no, flats, uh, apartments. apartments, yep, thank you. And we, we, all, we all rented one each, and um, so Justin was one, Ray was one, what Graham was, a, and I was one, one. and uh, I remember Justin calling me one day and said, I've just written this song. And I went down to his flat and he played it to me. And uh, the rest is history, really. Uh, but it's, I, I can't really talk for, for Justin because he wrote it. But um, I think it's in everyone's interpretation of the song that makes it real. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, when you see a video, it's a director's variation or his idea what the song is about. But when you listen to yourself with headphones, sure. it can mean a million things to everyone. It becomes very personal. Yeah. I think that's what's cool about music in general, though, and something that's universal, is that what is a breakup song for one person is a love song for another person, and a fight song for another person. It's so subjective, and, and it really is a universal language. There's just so much you can take from it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Yagis, I apologize, from Seattle, is that correct? Yagis. Yagis, forgive me, Yagis. Yagis from Seattle. How much of the poetry in Before and After the Songs were written by Graham Edge? Um, um, Graham, when we recorded um, Days of Future Past, we wanted somehow to bind the whole album together. And Graham was a great poet. Uh, he wrote great lyrics. Uh, great poetry, and he was a great reader of books. And we said to Graham, can you write something that holds the complete album together? And he did, and he wrote, breathe deep in the gathering crew. And it, it was brilliant. It, it was, blew us all away. And from there on in, um, he wrote the poetry for albums after that. Beautiful. Uh, how did Timothy Leary react to the song about him? We, um, Tim Leary said to us one day, you made me more famous than I am. <laughs> but, you. Uh, uh, but we, you know, actually Tim Leary used to come and see us on tour and, um, various times he'd come on stage and play tambourine and um, uh, through the years he brought his son along and his son played tambourine with him. And, uh, Fantastic. Yeah and actually we rec when Tim Leary was uh, um, dying, passing away, uh, we spoke to him and recorded uh, a new version of Tim Leary and it was, <laughs> Timothy Leary's alive. <laughs> and he loved it. That's sweet. Uh, David, uh, here's, the, here's the right down the, fastball down the middle question. David from Florida, please tell us, how did you even come to be in the Moody's? Um, 
the algorithm. I knew that it wasn't going to return. On stage, you hear me say that I met Ray Thomas when I was 15, and we did form a band called Al Wright and the Rebels. And for four years, we traveled all around the Midlands playing uh, various clubs and everything. And um, we used to play, uh, there's public houses in England were called, owned by Mitchells and Butlers. And they wanted a band to play in their own concert places using the initials M and B. So they wanted to form a super group and Ray said to me, John, you, do you want to join? And, we, and I said, well, I've got 18 months to do the college and uh, I, 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 I want to fin finish my college. And um, so I didn't join. And um, then they had Go Now, of course, which is a fabulous record. And um, then 18 months later, Ray rang me and said, Hey, Rocker, have you finished college yet? <laughs> and I said, I have just finished. He said, Well, get down to London and uh, come on, join the band. And that's how we won. And there you are. And that's how we got what we all know. Yeah. This is a great question. Nancy, all the way from California. What musicians or groups are impressive enough that you would go out of your way to see them in concert? Um, I love live music. I love live music. And so any local club, wherever I'm in the, uh, in the world, I'll ask someone who has his live music and I'll go and watch them. So I'll go uh, out of my that way. But the other way is uh, Eric Clapton, yes. Dave Gilmore. Yes. These, these are people I actually do go and see, uh, and I, I love it, you know, and uh, I love mu live music, and, uh, yeah. and I'll be seeing lots of musicians on this trip as well, I, the cruise. I think that's one of the great things, is that people, I think it's easy to forget sometimes because all of us are fans that you are fans you are a fan of other artists and other artists are fans of you it's not it's not like you guys all keep to yourselves it's kind of a reunion in some ways and you get to see folks that maybe you haven't seen for a year or longer and uh, i had a woman it wasn't it was actually last year when you were here she was very upset because she didn't see you anywhere she's like he's never out and you were literally sitting about 15 feet away from us <laughs> And I didn't want to out you. I didn't want to be like, well, he's right there. Go bother him. But I was staring at you as she was complaining to me. And I was like, well, he's right there enjoying the show, which you should be doing right now. Um, it, you, you are a fan. You do like to go see other music, which I think is beautiful. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and, and you say people I haven't seen for a long time. When we was at the hotel before we got on the ship, uh, Leo Sayer came up to me and said, John. And I said, Leo, we hadn't seen him for... 20 years and uh, we, you know we were in the same agency in London uh, all those years ago it's uh, fantastic he is a wonderfully charming and uh, eccentric man uh, he is a ton of fun did you get a word in in that conversation or was it yeah. <laughs> comes to us from Overland Park, uh, and he says, any, oh, that's a good question, any views on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? It took until 2018 to get you and the Moody Blues in, finally, and of course, there's still so many deserving bands that are not in. What's your view on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, it's difficult, no, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so cold anymore. <laughs> I, you know, you don't get into this business for accolades. It's, it's not like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> when, <laughs> when the, like, it, like, yeah. yeah, and uh, so uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think, is great because it, it is a centre for people to go to. Uh, it's really nice uh, to visit 
all this, if you're a golfer, it's great to go to the golfing museum. If you, whatever, it's right. nice to go to a centre and see all the memorabilia and everything else. For me, it was wonderful because I remember standing on stage and thinking, I can't believe this, I'm standing next to Buddy Holly, <laughs> you know, somebody I've looked up to all my life. And then another thought came to my head, and I thought about my grandson probably visiting there years to come and say, oh, that's my granddad there. <laughs> what better accolade can there be? Was it, uh... <sighs> Forgive this question. Was it, did you feel validated to get in or was it to your point, you don't do it for the validation, you're performing to perform and it's just another, wow, wonderful accolade or did it mean something more in terms of being recognized in that way? Uh, for me, um, for me, it was a big thank you yeah. to all the fans. I didn't feel that were, that were, it was me being in the Hall of Fame. It felt like all the fans should have been there. Great perspective. And thank you very much for keeping the show. Well, you also, you're very big into charity. You, you tell us a little bit about your, your you're in a couple different your clubs and whatnot. I know you're, uh, tell us about the water rats. Uh, the water rats. <laughs> the water rats was, uh, it's a charity in England, worldwide, worldwide charity. Um, and um, um, we lo it looks after people in homes, uh, elderly people, people who are um, disabled or something's gone wrong with their lives. And, uh, it's a great charity. Um, I've also, I'm in the Variety Club in the UK, which looks after children, and we buy, buy uh, buses to take them to the seaside, the, to the coast, where they probably haven't been before. And um, in Barb I have a charity in Barbados, um, exactly for children as well. It's all for children, everything. What, kind of a redundant question, but what, why the passion to give back to children specifically? What is it about, uh, as opposed to all the other charities, what directs you in that? Because children, you need, having children in my, of uh, myself, it, they're the future, and you've got to give them every help you can. And um, if the, for some reason they haven't got the uh, ability or whatever to promote themselves, I think it's great to be helped, help them along and try and find what will make their life more successful, but more than that, be happy. Yeah. 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 Love that. Well, this is fun. Uh, question for John Lodge from John Lodge. <laughs> the third. <laughs> One up to you there. Uh, this John Lodge comes to us from Houston, Texas. First and foremost, tell John I am so, so happy to see him back. I knew he would come. Uh, who books tours for you? I'd like you at a private party in Texas. Can everybody come here? Yes, yes. Just send the request in. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, second to last year, Amy from New York City, Florida, and Jersey. Amy, Amy's making moves. Uh, <laughs> Not right now, Amy, but you can in a moment. Can I please show you my dot, 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 uh, 1987 Garden State Art Center program and news articles. She has some keepsakes. 
Uh, Mr. Lodge is actually going to sign for us after the event today. We're not going to rush the front of the stage. We're actually going to go around, and or we're going to go around. And you, if you would like an autograph, are going to be outside that door in a few minutes. So uh, once we're done, yes, you're welcome to bring that up, obviously. Yeah, not every one of us is so generous with their time, so thank you for that. Uh, is it uh, from near Chicago? Forgive me, is that Denise? I can't quite read the top. Is that right, Denise? Okay. What became, oh, it's kind of leading back to the start of this. What became of your song that you wrote during COVID, The Sun Will Shine? Um, I'm working uh, on a new album. And I, I hope... Hang on, I don't think they heard you. The legendary John Lodge is working on new music, my friend. Uh, and the song will be featuring on that, I'm ah, sure. There you go. Thank you very much, Denise. Before we let you get out of here, uh, a couple last questions. Um, you said a, a while back, you love to tour, you love to travel. It's the gypsy in me, have bass, will travel. <laughs> is that a younger man's version, or is that still the man you are today? It's still the person I am today. <laughs> Uh, just before I came here today, we were just discussing touring during the summer. So, Ab Base will travel, will be coming to a venue near you, I hope. And last but not least, before we uh, send you back around to the autograph table, what does it mean for you? to get up on stage, and I know half this audience hasn't seen you yet, half of the live audience has, but by the time this airs, most people will have. Uh, what does it mean for you to get on stage in front of this type of crowd that is on this cruise, specifically for the great music of the 70s, and a lot of them specifically for you? What is it like to get up there and perform for a crowd like this? It's brilliant. I have to say, it is brilliant. The, um, the enthusiasm from the audience, that energy comes on stage, not just for me, but for my musicians on stage and for my road crew backstage. They're all excited uh, from the reaction from everybody in the audience, and I thank you for that. Really do thank you all. It, it, it's interesting, because I think, yeah, well, it's I try to do my best when I go out front to let an audience know it's okay to scream. It's okay, it's okay to clap and, sh and cheer and shout because I've had audience members from all over the world and I've been blessed to be doing what I do for almost 20 years say to me, oh, we don't want to interrupt the performer. Oh, we don't want to, we, we, we just want to, we want to listen and I get that. But I think sometimes it's lost that the fourth wall is an entertainment term which is technically the wall between the entertainer and the audience that in a live setting, we don't want a fourth wall. We, we want you, and I say we, forgive me, we want you to, yeah, we want you to interact, we want you to scream, right? I mean, it, it, it feels good to hear people singing your lyrics and screaming and shouting and dancing. And the, the, for me, the most important thing in life as well is eye contact. If you can see someone and through their eyes and they can see you, you've got a great relationship starting straight away. That's exactly right. So whether you are sitting here with us live or whether you're watching on TV, take that note on all the shows, regardless of which room you're in, whether you're in the big room or at the pool or in the sky lounge, uh, be energetic, have fun. No artist is ever going to be upset because you get excited at something they are doing. The more energy you have as a crowd, it feeds the performers on stage and they absolutely love it. So please don't be shy. Not that that's something I have to tell this crowd very often. But, uh, uh, thank you so much for your time. Today. Jason, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. My friends and family, whether you're watching home or you're doing favorite, let's go.
inviting you to join us and many of our good friends on board the 70s Rock and Romance Cruise. The 70s Rock and Romance Cruise is back in 2024, and it's sure to be one rockin' reunion. You'll see over 50 live performances from the bands that made the 70s so special, including Foreigner performing the hits at sea, Randy Bachman, founder of Bachman Turner Overdrive, and the Guess Who, Dave Mason, War, Generation Radio, Ambrosia, Pablo Cruz, Firefall, Orleans, Queen Nation, Hotel California, a salute to the Eagles, Credence Revived, and many more to be added soon. Enjoy seven days under the sun while rocking out with the best in classic rock. Setting sail March 14th on the Celebrity Summit from Miami and making stops in the beautiful Southern Caribbean ports of Aruba and Curacao. As always, go behind the scenes with the stars at over 25 celebrity interactive events, including Q&As, panel discussions, and more. Plus, celebrate the culture of the 70s with nightly pool parties that will keep you singing and dancing all night long. Join us in 2024 and relive the era that made you feel so good.